God, what an amazing truth, the bliss of this glorious thought that my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise you, O Lord. We praise you. We thank you that you are a kind and gracious, forgiving God who will put as far as the east is from the west every sin of everyone who believes in your son. And it is only for that reason that we are here together today singing these songs, anticipating your return. And Lord, we do pray haste the day. Could it even be today that your son is vindicated, that your church is redeemed, that we are with you in glory God, we pray that as long as you leave us on this earth, we would be faithful about your business, that we would be found faithful stewards, faithful slaves, eagerly anticipating your return. Lord, we ask this morning that by your Holy Spirit, your people would hear your word, that we would be soft under it, that you would transform us, renew our minds, cause us to be a church that resembles a people under the reign of grace. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Do I need to go to the pulpit, Mike? I have a lot of... uh, If it's just me, I can live with it. Go to this. Okay. piano uh, for a song. I was going to play that song at my grandmother's memorial. And uh, the heel of my shoe had come apart. So as I walked down the long aisle of this big Baptist church on the wood floor, clop, 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 went the shoe and broke the silence of a very somber, serious moment. And my dad was in tears, laughing. And as I walked down the aisles, he said, it is not well with his soul. (laughs) Every other time he cried over that song, it was because of the reflections of the, on the gospel. Well, this morning we're in Romans chapter 12 again, and we're looking at Paul's directives for the Christian life. How do we live the Christian life? As those living sacrifices before the Lord, as those not being squeezed by the world, but being transformed, recalibrated, renewed in the mind by the word of God, how are we to live? And in verses 9 through 13 of Romans 12, Paul has been giving us 13 directives for life together in the church. We are a body. We are members one of another in interdependent, close relationship. How does that work out in flesh and blood? And so we have these 13 commands for life in the body of Christ, beginning in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. We've covered the first three, love genuinely, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, and this morning we'll cover numbers four and five, found in verse 10. And directive number four, found in the first half of verse 10, is to love Christians unbreakably. That is the command. And the way Paul puts it here is, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And the two main words in this first half of verse 10 are family words. Two family words are to describe Christian love in the church. And the first is be devoted. 
the sort of verbal form in here. It is the word philostorgos. It is a compound word that combines affectionate love with the natural ties of blood relatives. It is a word that describes warm family love. It is a word that is used to describe the tenderness of love in the closest of relationships. It is the love of blood relatives, of natural family affection. This is the word that is used for the fierce love of a mother for her children, the love that motivates a mother to do nearly anything for her own, that unbreakable love that a mother has for her kids. In fact, it is shocking and heartbreaking when you hear of parents who neglect or harm their own children. If there is to be devoted love anywhere in this fallen world, it ought to be seen in the tenderness of affections between parents and their children. Jesus even said, you men, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. This is the very foundation of devoted love. And when Paul says, be devoted to one another, he's saying, have the kind of warm, affectionate, family, unbreakable closeness that's described here. And he says, be devoted in that way to what he calls brotherly love. And this is a Greek word you know, Philadelphia. It is a combination of words, again, combining affectionate love and the word for a brother. This is affectionate love for brothers, Philadelphia. For as long as I had known him, my grandpa went to reunions. It seems like he was going to reunions multiple times a year, and he went to reunions with his war buddies. He was a bomber pilot and flew in World War II and the Cold War and Vietnam. But he particularly felt close to the men he flew with in World War II, the men with whom my grandpa endured harrowing experiences, the men that were confined together over the, over the factories of Schweinfurt when shrapnel penetrated the bomber and, and men lost friends. They saw bombers go down. They fought side by side against a common enemy. They faced mortal dangers together and they came through together. Similarly, my dad flew 200 combat missions in Vietnam. And decades after the short stint together, the men who fought together in that war remembered each other fondly, mourned over lost brothers in arms. They exchanged cards and letters. They attended each other's children's weddings. Up until recently, at, at his own homecoming, my dad's squadron commander from Vietnam still sent me personal notes and cards because of the short time he and my dad spent together in war. These shared experiences under fire created unique and unbreakable bonds. Men who were willing to lay down their lives for each other were lashed together with cords of affection that, frankly, outsiders could not understand, and few forces could break. Truly, they became a band of brothers. Now, consider what you have in common with the brothers and sisters around you in this church. You began your earthly existence separated from God. In fact, at enmity with God. By nature, sinners. By nature, running a course headlong towards eternal destruction. Running away from God. Seeking to be God of your own life. You were separated from those who loved God. You were enslaved to sin. You were, as Ephesians 2 says, spiritually dead. And then you were rescued. Think about the way that survivors of some natural disaster embrace each other after coming through a harrowing experience. You see, to love other believers is the reasonable response of a brotherhood forged in unforgettable experiences. You were lost and then you were found. You were dead and you were made alive. You were hellbound and then you were made a citizen of heaven. And that is true not just of you individually, but of us corporately as believers. We have experienced these things together. We were, each of us, in mortal, eternal danger. And we were impossibly rescued. 
You and I have been rescued together by the same God, the same gospel, and placed together in this community of the rescued. And now we've been attached to each other like members of a physical body. We have become part of each other, dependent upon each other, and committed to each other with parental tenderness and brotherly affection, these family words of unbreakable love. Listen to the connection in 1 Peter 1 between the gospel that saves us and the love that we are to have for one another. Peter writes, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. And there in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 23, you have something of a love sandwich. The love of God dispensed to us and our love for each other. And our love for each other is commanded and commended in between the reminders of the infinite love of God given to us in Jesus Christ. It ought to be as natural to love, as easy to love Christians as it is your own flesh and blood. Have you ever had the experience of meeting a Christian in a foreign country or in an unexpected place? Maybe after talking a little, maybe each of you looking for some way to start talking about the gospel. How can I share the gospel with this person? And then you both realize into the conversation that this stranger is a stranger no longer. We both love Christ. We've both been rescued by the same gospel. Whatever the backgrounds, whatever the differences in language or culture or dress or food or experiences, you realize that you are closer than blood and your heart is suddenly full of eternal love for someone you only just met. Have you had that experience? It ought to be natural to love Christians. Your natural siblings, your brothers and sisters by blood, cannot offend themselves out of your life, and they may try. Your sister will always be your sister, and your brother will always be your brother. And I know that some sibling relationships are not what they should be, but generally speaking, brothers may fight each other, but when someone picks a fight with a brother, they've picked a fight with all the brothers. There is a tightness, a bond that comes with being siblings. And typically, these bonds are unbreakable bonds. You could discard a friend who offends you. You can stop being friends with somebody. But a sister? A brother? And this command here in in Romans 12.10 for brotherly love and being devoted to brotherly love for one another means that relationships in the body of Christ are not disposable. They're not discardable. They are designed to be enduring. They are designed by Christ to transcend and survive the kinds of difficulties that bring other relationships to an end. These two family words, devotion and brotherly love, describe intense, devoted, unbreakable love. They indicate that the church is to be a family. The ties that bind us are actually eternal ties. What ought the world to see in a church? When the world looks at us, they should see Christians fondly affectionate for each other feeling and expressing the kind of unbreakable love that siblings have for each other, the kind of tender devotion that parents have for their children. This is the kind of love that the church at Thessalonica in the first century was known for. Paul writes, Now as to the love of brethren, Philadelphia, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love, agape is the word there, one another. 
For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, and we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. That was a church commended for their devoted love for one another. They were known for it. They were famous for it. And Paul says, keep striving in that love. Consider the people around you this morning. What has brought these people together? What could have possibly brought the, together the, those assembled in this room? I'm not sure that we would have sought out each other's friendship, but the Lord sought us, and the Lord bought us, and sovereignly placed us together in a community of the redeemed. He made us to be brothers and sisters. He made us to be family. And he has given us affections for others that have come through the door of eternal salvation and through the doors of this local assembly of the redeemed. But this love has to be cultivated. It ought to be natural for Christians, and at some level it is produced by the Holy Spirit in us, who has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. But it also must be cultivated, and therefore we have this command in Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Sometimes we get comfortable in our relationships. Perhaps sometimes we get lazy in our relationships. Sometimes we forget the big picture. We forget who we were and who we are. We forget the true identity of those around us. Maybe you've lost sight this morning of even the very privilege of having deep Christian friendships. Could be possible that you've been squeezed into the mold of this world in such a fashion that Christian friendships are not highly prized. How do we follow this directive in Romans 12.10? How do we cultivate with each other brotherly love, a devotion to brotherly love? I believe it starts with what Paul has already outlined in this chapter. Your life as a living sacrifice, Romans 12.1. You don't live for yourself. You live as a sacrifice before God. His will wins. I want to live my life pleasing to him. And it begins with what Paul said in verse 2, an internal reorientation, that we are fighting against the regular pressure of the world to squeeze us into its mold, and we are seeking to cultivate a renewal of mind by dependence on God's thoughts, being transformed in the inner man by the truths of God's word. And it's dependent on Romans 12, 3, a radical humility. Paul says, through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. And a commitment to Romans 12, 4 and 5, the perspective of the church as a body, interdependent relationships, we are members of one another. I depend on you and you depend on me. And it all flows out of the command, which is the chief command over all of these 13 there in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. That command for sincere, unpretended, real agape love that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. To truly have this kind of practical, affectionate, unbreakable love for each other in the church also requires that we take up an eternal perspective. These are your brothers forever. These are your sisters into eternity. 10,000 years from now, how would you wish you had cared for relationships in the body of Christ? How would you wish that devotion to brotherly love would have looked? What a tragedy it is when personal offenses separate brothers and sisters in Christ. Either giving offense or taking offense. And listen, it takes work. It takes the work of humble, selfless love to not give offense to think about others around me, to put myself in their shoes and, and to work hard not to be offensive. That takes work. It takes self-emptying, humble labor. And it takes work. It takes humble, selfless love to not take offense, to not be offended at people around me, to not turn misunderstandings into grievous offenses. It takes self-emptying, humble labor to not take offense. And this kind of love requires that we be patient with one another, that we pray for one another diligently, 
that we confess sins to one another. It requires prayerful, humble addressing of offenses when necessary. It requires the humble receiving of correction. It requires a commitment to peacemaking. The Apostle John said in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. He who does not love abides in death. The kind of love enjoined for us here is characteristic of a believer. If this doesn't exist, you have no claim on Christ. And this is to be the hallmark of the Christian. This love is on display particularly when it is tested. Listen, there's no miracle on display when we love people that are easy to be around, people that make our lives comfortable and easy or There's no miracle on display when we keep uncomfortable people at a distance. Hey, I don't want to sin against them, so I'm just not going to be around them. Or when we retreat from relationships that are uncomfortable, make us uneasy. Or perhaps when we avoid real spiritual conversation just to keep things at a polite, comfortable level. This kind of love is on display when we dive into relationships with each other. Giving and serving and meeting needs and praying and rejoicing and weeping and singing together. When we are committed to each other in a way that says, I'm in this with you to the end. Listen, when your blood brother sins against you, you can't just go get a new brother. Well, you shouldn't. You've been rescued from death together, Christians. You've been through life together your family. That is designed to be an unbreakable bond. And the church ought to be a community of unbreakable relationships characterized by the affectionate bonds of selfless love. The second half of verse 10 gives us directive number five. Directive number five is simply this, honor others competitively. Honor others competitively. The New American Standard says it this way, give preference to one another in honor. This is something of an awkward sentence in the original. The New American Standard says, give preference to one another in honor. The ESV and the Holman Bible say, outdo one another in showing honor. That's probably closer to the original. What does it mean, first of all, to prefer someone else? to give preference to someone. It means that another's needs or interests are more important to me than my own. To prefer their desires, to defer to their preferences, to seek to know what they like and what they need ahead of what I like and what I need. This is a tall order. It means that another person's interests and needs are more important to me than my own. I think about standing in a long line to pay for groceries at the store, and you notice someone who's having a difficult time, and you let them go first. You value their need to get through the line higher than you value your own need to get through the line. This is seen in a young mother spoon-feeding a toddler at the table while her own dinner gets cold. Or a father-in-law driving up the Beeline Highway to rescue his kids and grandkids when their vehicle's stranded on a cold, wet Saturday afternoon. Hypothetically. But this verse does not simply command us to prefer one another. Uh, The original is awkward uh, for us, perhaps, but emphatic. Take the lead to give honor to one another. Get out in the front to initiate giving honor to each other. Win at honoring. The honor was very important in Near Eastern culture. Honor was given on the basis of status, and class, rank, titles, positions, land holdings, or nobility. In Western civilization, we've done away with some of this to some degree, sort of an archaic idea of class systems and noble people uh, versus us common folk. But we still do this to some degree. We, we elevate people to a different status than ourselves, even in the land of the, the free and equal opportunities. We elevate celebrities 
athletes, power brokers, bosses, CEOs, maybe even celebrity pastors. Think about what you would do if you met today a U.S. president. Or how would you behave in the presence of your favorite sports hero? Or your favorite author? Or inventor? Or an entrepreneur? Or a military hero? Or a world-class musician? What if you met the best of the best in your industry? Or a billionaire? Would you listen carefully to what they say? Would you offer to buy his lunch or to get her a bottle of water? Would you defer to their preferences or ask them what they want to do? Most likely, you would bend over backwards to meet that person's needs and desires. You would set aside your own agenda for the immediate interests of a person of great nobility or great accomplishment. You would no doubt give your full attention and resources to make sure that that person was comfortable, that that person received honor and acclaim in accordance with his status. And what Paul directs believers to in this verse is to outdo one another in giving honor to each other. That is, you are to see every member of the body of believers as one deserving such honor that you look around the room in the local assembly of believers, the local church, and you see everybody around you as of higher rank, higher class, greater nobility, higher status, better achievement than yourself. You were to race to the front of the line to give honor to others. Athletes are always looking for a competitive edge What little thing can I do to be a little better than the other guy or the other team? Practice more, cross-train harder, eat better, or even employ some ethically shady tactics. Stealing signs in baseball, taking performance-enhancing substances, placing cameras in the opponent's fields, deflating football. (laughs) I almost said that. Businessmen similarly strive for a competitive edge. How can I beat my competitors and acquire more market share for my product? The world runs with this kind of ambition. The ambition to be better is often motivated by the desire to make a greater name for myself, to make more money, to gain more power, to be more famous, more celebrated, to become a household name. The Christian's ambition, however, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, is what? To be pleasing to the Lord. We make it our ambition to be pleasing to the Lord. What does pleasing to the Lord look like in the body of Christ? It's outlined for us here to manifest itself in a profound humility combined with love for others that drives us to compete with each other in a race to honor each other, to outdo for one another in honor. And listen, this is not our natural tendency. Our natural tendency, no matter how whitewashed it may be by social convention, the natural tendency of the human heart is to race to honor self. And sometimes that race to honor self is cloaked in the guise of a phony humility that I can exalt myself as appearing humble. We do this in any number of ways. We engage in one-upmanship, one better achievement, one better story, one better joke than the other person. Maybe you do this by bringing others down to elevate self. If I can bring someone down in my own mind, I can have a more inflated view of myself. If I can highlight someone else's mistakes or errors or foibles or sins, then that boosts my own confidence in my own standing. There are a lot of ways we seek to put others on a lower plane and recreate a caste system in our minds in order to exalt ourselves in our own hearts, to highlight our own successes, make ourselves the heroes of our own stories. There are a lot of contrivances in the human heart that seek to elevate self, and it's deceptive. 
The British Empire was a world-class empire. I mean, think about it. An island off the northwest coast of Europe, cold Atlantic waters, if they were going to eat anything other than potatoes and fish, were going to have to go elsewhere to get it. And so the British islanders built a merchant marine to go all over the world to get other stuff to eat. And they became masters at trade. And in order to protect that merchant marine, they created a military navy that dominated the other navies of the world and spread the British Empire such that it could be said that the sun never set on the British Empire. Somewhere, the British flag was flying, the sun was shining. Many of the lands of the former British Empire have thrown off uh, the Brits. But the British gave the empire a remarkable gift, the queue, the line. You might be thinking, oh, I hate standing in line. Try not standing in line. If you've been in another part of the world, another part of the country where they don't queue up, where they don't have lines, where it is a mad dash to the clerk at the window to try to get the government office business taken care of that you need taken care of today, and you have to fight off everybody else to get there, or else that will never get done, and you'll come back the next day and find another crowd with no line pressing in at the window. If you have that experience a few times, you will once again be thankful for the line. Our world operates with no line when it comes to self-absorption, self-achievement, self-flattery, self-congratulation. The entire world is massing with no line, pressing towards the front to win for self a claim. How can I get all the world around me to think as highly of myself as I think of myself? And the natural tendency of the human heart is to race to the front to get everybody behind me to think highly of me. Paul's command here in verse 10 is just the opposite. To race to the front of the line in order to give honor to each other. It means a competitive approach to humility. Uh, This is not to be empty flattery. Empty words of honor. But it is to truly believe that no one is below you. There's no one below you. Paul knew this in 1 Timothy 1. He expressed his own thought that he was the worst sinner ever. And he uses present tense verbs to describe his present situation as a believer. He's not talking about his former life when he calls himself chief of sinners. He is aware of his own crimes before the Lord. He's aware of his own, the the depths of his own residual depravity to such a degree that he's not willing to put any of the worst sins of humanity in front of his own crimes against his creator. That is the only way to have this kind of radical humility that's required here for this kind of love in the body of Christ. To truly believe that there is no one below you. To truly believe and act as if every believer is to be treated as of higher rank, greater status, their needs are more important than my own. To not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. It means that we're not to think of ourselves as someone of higher rank giving honor to someone of lower rank. It really is a remarkable thing when someone of greater status, greater achievement, greater accomplishment humbles himself to be on the same level as the rest of us, the hoi polloi. Really is a remarkable thing to watch. But we dare not start with the view that people are lower than we are and we must condescend to where they are. We must start with a right apprehension of our own selves. It requires an accurate understanding of your standing before God, an accurate understanding of what you actually deserve and what you get instead by the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, the fuel for this command is Romans 1 to 11. The gospel itself, the undeserved mercy of God in display 
in that God himself would take on flesh, come to the earth to die on a cross in place of sinners. There's no greater example of greatness humbled than God himself. Philippians 2, Paul writes this, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete, Christians, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another, here it is, as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, or even because he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And before his death, Jesus modeled this very thing. I want you to turn to John 13 and see what it looks like to have affectionate love for others and to outdo others in honor, to give preference to others in honor. This is true humility. John 13, of course, records the scene of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. A menial task, a dirty task, that the lowest ranked person in the household would do. John 13, 1, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world and to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you were clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are truly the one we look to as the model of radical humility, of outdoing all others to honor the undeserving. God, we pray that this body would excel still more in brotherly love, in preferring one another, God, may we resemble our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
May we live under the reign of grace in a way that makes grace attractive to a watching world. May they see our love and they be, may they be drawn to you, O oh God. We ask for the reflection on the gospel, reflection on the truths of who we were and what we deserved and of a renewed view of your love for us to produce in us this kind of humility and love for one another, all for your glory in Jesus' name.